Hey, good morning, everyone. I am Bernard Young, President of the Asian Bureau of Finance and Economic Research, and Stephen Distinguished Professor at the National University of Singapore Business School. Uh, welcome to this panel, Asia Economic Outlook. Um, the world is having a very challenging time, searching inflation expectations, rising dollar and interest rates, growing government deficits, and worried about sovereign debts. At the same time, the hot and cold war and techno-nationalism push the world away from cooperation and attending to critical, import, critically important problems like the thing that we talk about a lot, the global warming and aging population. Furthermore, the current situation deepens disparity within and across regions and genders. The resulting inefficient as well is likely to deprive 4 billion people in China, India, Asia, and Africa of the needed resources to improve their living standards. Well, despite these challenges, Asia is doing relatively well. It is expected to grow. Uh, if you look at the IMF and the World Bank reports and so on, that this region will grow at about 5% or slightly higher in some and, and higher in some countries, and India is really doing well. Uh, some countries benefit from companies and capital seeking safe harbors and location diversification. Many here do not want a necessary dispute. Still, China's COVID policy China's economic performance and the growing tension with the U.S. Uh, uh, present looming concerns. Asia's continuous growth is really not preordained. We have an excellent panel here, and we are really uh, blessed to have them. Uh, let me just introduce them uh, by the affiliation and according to uh, alphabetical order. On my right is Mr. Santos Cavilli, CEO and founder of ProArch. On my left is uh, Professor Roger King. He is an adjunct professor of finance and the founding director and senior <coughs> advisor of the Roger King Center of Asia Family Business and Entrepreneurship Studies and the Thompson Center for Business Case Studies at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And my father left is Professor Alexandro Reyes. He's the Director of Knowledge Dissemination and, and, and is an adjunct professor at Asia Global Institute of Hong Kong U. And to my far right, last but not least, is Muret Sinapzov. Sorry, my pronunciation is lousy. <laughs> Pardon me for that. He's the Chairman of Caspian Week from Switzerland. To start the conversation, may I first ask Roger on my left to spend a few minutes on the economic outlook in China and East Asia. Roger, we hope to hear from you your insights on the, some bright spots and some worrisome concerns. Please. Uh, thank you uh, very much, and thank you for attending this uh, <coughs> session itself. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, actually, uh, for the last uh, decade, I've been focused on family businesses and uh, uh, recently um, family offices. And, uh, you know, uh, for those of you probably uh, familiar with it, you, you know, most economies, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the GDP is actually contributed by family businesses itself. Okay, and this is also true also in China, despite the fact it's, uh, you know, a socialistic, uh, communistic uh, uh, nation itself. So, uh, uh, there's lots of challenges in the uh, family business today. Uh, you know, we got the COVID, we got, uh, you know, but the biggest challenge, I tell you, and I may or may not be aware of it, you know, we all talk about the uh, uh, various uh, things uh, such as Industrial Revolution 4.0 4 and so forth and so on, but it turns out that the, the most of the uh, uh, Chinese family businesses, they send their children abroad to study in the universities overseas, whether it's uh, uh, Canada, United States, UK, uh, Australia, and so forth. And guess what? After they receive their degree, the traditional Chinese expect them to come back and work for the family. Now, several years ago, the Shanghai Jiao Tong University did a study, 
it turns out that 80%, age zero, do not want to join the family business. Then the question is, what happens to the family business? So this is a different kind of challenge that I'm uh, introducing to this audience itself, okay? And uh, so what do they want to do? Well, they all want to become horses. Why they want to be horses? For those of you familiar with, uh, he, you know, uh, Jack Ma, Ma is a horse in Chinese, and uh, 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 to, uh, yeah, to, Tony Ma, the ten cent thing. So they all want to start their own venture. So this is one of the biggest challenges in the, uh, our, our uh, situation also. And the other uh, challenge, uh, uh, I'll just introduce these uh, issues, and I'm a little bit off the subject itself. You know, lifespan is increasing. We saw a chart of how things are. You, you know, I'm sure many people in this room have relatives that are close to 100 or over 100 years old. So, but business life cycle is getting shorter and shorter. Then how do you maintain that in the family itself? This is the biggest challenge, especially when the next generation doesn't want to join the uh, family business, okay? And uh, so lifespan is increasing, business life cycle is shortening, and so what we are studying nowadays is what we call from family business to business family. So what happens is the business starts a portfolio of businesses, and the parents can actually create an angel fund to allow next generation to start their own ventures itself. This is very, very important. And of course, once they have these portfolio businesses and so forth, and we move further on into the new concept of uh, family office itself. Family office is not a new concept, okay? And many, many people think of family office as a uh, uh, center for family to invest assets. But from our perspective, that's too narrow. And we call it the 3P concept. First is preservation of family wealth, okay? Which is asset management and so forth. The second is very, very important. And for Asians, this is extremely important, the concept of preserving family harmony, okay? I don't know about Japan, but you know, in the uh, ethnic Chinese world, most family businesses do not survive more than three generations. The second generation where the wealth is created, that's when the problem starts, okay? And, and uh, actually, a good friend of mine, uh, Philip Markovici, he wrote a book, uh, highly recommended to all of you. It's called The Destructive Power of Family Wealth. Okay. I, I'm going to tap on you later on, on all this thing. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Your, the third, your third P is? Third P is preservation of family value and family legacy. That is very, very important. Okay. So I probably uh, all went off of your, your tangent on, on your <laughs> subject, but uh, I, I thought I'd bring this up. I, yeah. I really welcome uh, what you've said. I grew up in Hong Kong, and I know how important is the small business grow into a family business uh, in propelling the economy's growth and vibrancy. But you're highlighting that there's some uh, problems about the transition, about the professionalization, about how they continue with the legacy while the world is changing very fast. And if I may add, there's some concern about, in some regions, the respect of private property rights and the allowance of the free market uh, to, to, to room in the, uh, to, to, to blossom in their pursuing of uh, personal wealth and helpful to society. So we'll get back to you later. I mean, how we can garnish all this together to make them make uh, even greater contribution to the whole region, and thanks for that. Now let me turn to Alexandro. Um, the same thing for Asian. So would you mind to enlighten us, like give us your insight at the bright spots and problematic concerns. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard, and uh, thank you very much to um, Horacius and to Frank uh, for um, convening this meeting in person, which is very exciting, and uh, also for uh, I finally you know break out of my Zoom box. So thank you very much for that opportunity. <laughs> I hope never to return. Um, now, uh, I have to sit at the edge of this seat, or else I'm going to fall asleep. Um, no. Um, so uh, let me just talk about the um, the. ASEAN plus three economies, uh, because uh, I'm, I, I'm a political economist by profession, but I'm 
these days much more involved in the geopolitics because they're so crazy. Um, so I, 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 I keep in touch with, I'll just be perfectly frank, with two organizations that I heartily recommend if you want to keep in touch with what's going on in the economies in this part of the world. One is the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council in Singapore. They just issued their State of the Region report. I recommend it very much. And then the other is the AMRO, the ASEAN Plus Three uh, Macro Research Office. They do excellent work. Um, I think the key points that I would bring out is that there are, of course, external headwinds that we're experiencing right now. The Ukraine war, the US-China rivalry, uh, downturn in the global economy, the lingering effects of the pandemic, particularly in the so-called plus three economies, China, uh, South Korea, and uh, Japan, because they, we've seen COVID surges, surges there, not so much in Southeast Asia. And then, of course, the uh, wondering about China, which is the big question mark in terms of its slowdown. Now, there's some good news in that the uh, global oil and food prices have sort of declined since earlier peaks in the spring, but they could, they'll remain volatile, so that's still a, a risk that we have to think about. Uh, inflation is also uh, still rising, reflecting more of that sort of pass-through of the high import prices and the weaker currencies due to uh, the interest rates uh, increases in the United States. So there is recovery of demand, and it's really stronger in ASEAN than in the plus three countries. Um, as I say, where COVID in the plus three countries, you still see, you see COVID um, surges. So, you know, just anecdotally, I mean, we're witnesses, there's more people are moving around. So that can only be a good thing, right? Um, this, is our, this is my third trip of the year. You know, thanks be to God. So uh, <laughs> more people are moving around, and I'm hosting more people in Hong Kong coming from Southeast Asia and elsewhere, so that's great. Um, ASEAN exports have held up, but, you know, there's a slowing demand. This is, again, the big risk. What is, this, what is the condition in the big markets, the United States, Europe, and China? And uh, that could hold back sort of expansion of exports. And indeed, um, as I mentioned, while inflation is... Uh, coming down and, mid, and, and, and go, um, the, you, you will still, still likely see central bank tightening across the region. Uh, so what that does uh, going forward um, uh, will be something to watch. I'll just give you what AMRO is expecting um, for the ASEAN plus three growth rate uh, this year would be, um, their forecast is 3.7%, which is down from their July estimate of 4.3%. Uh, and in 2023, they're expecting 4.6%, uh, which is, again, down from their 4.9% uh, estimate uh, forecast in July. So you can see that there's a kind of worries about what lies ahead, particularly in the United States in terms of inflation. I, um, I would just close uh, this uh, first um, intervention by just talking about the short-term risks. In terms of looking forward short-term risk, I would say the likelihood um, in terms of low likelihood is more COVID-19 surges, variants. Thank goodness, I, I think we're, we're kind of beyond it now. Um, a sharper downturn in China, I think the, uh, China is already pretty uh, laid low, so any further deterioration is unlikely, especially since in the last couple of weeks we've seen uh, China try to deal with its property market in a very significant way, and then we see already China easing COVID restrictions, which is uh, also very significant. Uh, medium risk uh, in the short term would be um, more monetary tightening in the U.S. and Europe, and but I, I think a high uh, risk in the short term would be um, deepening energy crisis uh, due to all the issues that you already know about the Ukraine war, et cetera. Um, on the immediate term, I think the biggest concern would be the geopolitics. This is why I get so frustrated um, day in, day out, uh, because this is really, as a former diplomat, this is what, what really vexes me. And, um, and then we cannot forget the perennial risks um, of climate change, the energy transition, how to pay for it. The news out of COP27 uh, is good. Um, we, of course, have to be concerned about natural disasters and cyber issues in this part of the world. And lastly, I would just mention in ASEAN, standout economies right now in terms of growth, Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia. What unites these countries? Well, these are countries that have been benefiting even before the 
pandemic, before Just China's closure, from the di need to diversify, the need to do have a China plus strategy. And uh, particularly, I would say Vietnam um, and Indonesia, the Philippines now, uh, we can talk about this later, has become a kind of darling in terms of the infrastructure and uh, foreign direct investment uh, opportunities. So thank you very much. Let, um, thank you, Alex. Uh, let's not leave a uh, East Asia so fast. I'm going to turn to Southeast Asia soon, but let me just take, take stock. Japan, we just heard uh, in the previous session, uh, has a lot of hope. Um, China right now has to worry about the housing market. Uh, the local government's fiscal stress is actually there. And its hands are also very tied because if it do a lot of stimulation, the, the, the property market may, may come back and haunt them again. Um, and then the COVID policy, I, I have the expectation that they're going to relax further and further in 2023 altogether. Maybe the first half some more and the second half totally. Um, at the same time, in, in, in that situation, um, what do you expect the growth to be? 5.5? I don't think it gets high, to be honest. Um, look, um, any expectation that they're going to move um, mm. forthrightly uh, on opening up, I, right. I, I think, uh, you know, we've been optimistic before. But we, we, uh, right. uh, in the past, you were saying, oh, after the party Congress, and then it was whatever, and now, and now it's like once the new government is formed. Mm -hmm. I, I think they, you know, look at what's happened in Hong Kong. That's where you take a cue from in terms mm -hmm. of how mm -hmm. quickly mm -hmm. or how slowly um, the mainland is going to open. I mean, in Hong Kong, we still have an outdoor mask uh, requirement, yeah. right? And all sorts of social distancing requirements. Right. Right. So I don't expect any significant um, opening up of the mainland mm -hmm. until May, uh, certainly until after the new government is formed in, right. in March and more than likely towards the yeah. end of 2023. 4.7% yes. is what I would say in terms 4. of 4.7. Yeah. 4.5, yeah, 4.7. I deliberately make an O number to right. stimulate you to say 4.7. Yeah, it's about 4.7, <laughs> I would say. In 4. other words, yeah. you know, there may be some hope, but don't be too excited. There's right. so many things that the Chinese government has to handle, including the property market, including the local government's fiscal stress, and also the regions are so varied. It's going to be play by play. We have to look at the regions by region. Just one quick uh, comment on that. Um, you know, it's interesting that they've made a move on the COVID uh, right. lifting COVID restrictions right. and on the property market right. even right. before the new right. government is placed. Yeah. Shows they're in a rush. Now, yeah. I'm going to create a, a straw man here. You know, you mentioned that the, the ASEAN countries and also Vietnam and all those countries, they were already receiving the diversification investment before. Actually, well before all these things that, 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 that happened in the past two, three years. And now, here's the thing. There is an, uh, there's a tendency to try to invest. At the same time, the US dollar is going up. And the local governments have no choice. The central banks would have to keep the interest rate high too. So I have two worries. Would there be possibly, because of the rising interest rate and the rising US dollar, that would there be any possible debt stress in that region? And also, is there any possibility that, because of geopolitics, people overreact and create wrong investment? I think you're spot on. I think that there's certainly those risks. Um, I was going to talk about this a bit later in the sense that I think the debt issue could affect any opportunities that countries see to improve infrastructure. Right. I think this could be a limiting factor and would be a problem because the infrastructure is almost the key to addressing the post-pandemic right. recovery. Right. right. So we really need to be prudent. There exists some hope. It's not all gloomy, but you have to really be careful, do it on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, let me turn the centos because uh, we want to now get into Southeast Asia. And can you follow the trend and give us some, uh, some uh, give us your perspective on the outlook? Uh, what are the bright spots and what do we have to worry about? Uh, like how is that related to energy price, uh, digitizations and so on? Please, Santos. First of all, good, <clears throat> good morning everybody. Um, I would like to thank uh, Horasis and uh, Frank for the opportunity. 
Um, and this is my first time here in Japan, so I'm glad to be here. I think we've established all the underlying factors that have a huge impact on Asia in general, right? We have uh, inflation, we have ongoing protracted invasion, we have geopolitical tensions that have escalated, and on top of that, we have still have ongoing pandemic. We have to learn how to live with COVID. And supply chain constraints and rising food and energy prices. All of this has had a devastating effect on low-income groups much more so than it has on the middle income or higher income groups, particularly in Southeast Asia. I witnessed that. And the impact was huge, especially for two years. So how do we promote inclusive growth? While this is a crisis, and I think it is going to be a crisis, it also presents an opportunity for countries, for, for private companies, and especially for entrepreneurs to step up. If we treat education as a crisis, I think it's really important that countries lay out a strong, aggressive policy making that can drive education at all levels, especially focusing on low-income groups. We have to drive resiliency through innovation. That's the only way out of this. And that has to be the impetus for governments, again, private companies, and as well as entrepreneurs. Strong policy making and the strong support of institutions is a must for us to come out of this. At the same time, during COVID, what I've seen is there was also an interesting change. The adoption of digital technology has been unprecedented. I can speak to Southeast Asia. There was always this informal cash economy that continued to live parallelly. Well, I would say, at the moment, I think most of that has converted into digital economy thanks to, to, to digital payments and other, other technologies. That's a huge step forward. That's inclusive because we're bringing all facets of the life into digitization. I've seen small to medium-sized businesses succeed, especially if they are digitally enabled. If you look at pre-pandemic, still there were a number of SMBs with no social or digital presence. I can't think of any company, irrespective of their size today, which with, with no digital presence. That's just not feasible anymore. So digitization is, is, it will remain to be the main and primary driver. Now on top of that, entrepreneurs. I think digital entrepreneurship is really important. And I think that's the way out of this current situation as we learn through how to live with this. Now on top of this, how do we bring in climate change, which has an impact on everybody? We've seen this in the recent past, especially in, in Asia, rising sea levels at an alarming rate. We've seen droughts in places they were, they were never droughts before. We've seen floods that were unprecedented. Now, another way to deal with this is, again, entrepreneurship, strong policy making, and ground level changes. Everybody has to participate in climate action. It's not just for governments. It's not just for uh, you know, big companies. It is for every citizen of Asia. And that's the message that we need to drive home. Thank you very much. Thank you. What I, my takeaway is that the current trend is creating a lot of disparity. 
At the same time, the longer trend, like the climate change, if you go to Indonesia and so on, you see that the, the, you already see the damage of the climate change. There are more floods and more things of that sort. Um, and so you, ha you, you worry about in, this, in, in the region that you, 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 you're familiar with, you worry about income inequality. The hardship is particularly on the poor people and you worry about the climate change and you advocate that digitization, maybe one way to allow the region to leapfrog um, to create something to, to improve their lots of life. Uh, I, following this trend, I'm going to, I'm going to turn to Murat. There are two things I turn to you for. Number one, we're talking about Asia. A uh, Capsian region is actually the connection and is a very important region. I want to hear from you. Let us understand the region's uh, current and potential contribution to the world and Asia. And second, I want to turn to you to ask, like, what kind of business leadership can provide in this digitization that, uh, uh, that uh, Santos just mentioned, that, that he started to launch into? Would you please? Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to say that we are grateful to Dr. Frank Richter, chairman of Horasis, uh, for bringing all of us here together in this beautiful city of Kitekusu. Uh, despite all the turbulences in this world, and uh, despite the uh, several attempts to do this event, which I discussed yesterday, and uh, it's actually the third attempt to do, and finally it is successful, and here I would rather say better late than never. And uh, I see here a lot of old friends, I found new friends, and I think this event will be very successful for all of us, uh, for the Kitokushu city, for the Japan, and uh, for the region which we are discussing in Asia. Uh, now, uh, back to the Caspian region, and here I would rather tell Greater Caspian region, uh, just to explain uh, that this is the big region uh, consisting of uh, countries surrounding the Caspian Sea, Central Asia, Afghanistan and Pakistan, Caucasus, and then countries surrounding the Black Sea. Uh, and uh, this region was called Greater Caspian region, and why, uh, why so? Because uh, all countries of, the, of this region are interconnected, uh, historically, economically, culturally, sometimes by language also, educationally, and there are really a lot of uh, links between these countries. Uh, and uh, this, can, uh, this region is very important to the world. There is $8 trillion GDP, 600 million people, and 10 million square kilometers. Uh, and uh, the, uh, this region is the future potential point of growth, uh, uh, the same like as Africa and Latin America. And uh, because of the recent geopolitical uh, events, uh, Russian-Ukraine war, for example, this region became extremely important for the world as a source of uh, energy. And uh, uh, here uh, we are talking a lot about the climate change, uh, but uh, to, reach the to reach the final goal, you first need to go through different stages. And uh, I think the very important stage for the region and for the Asia is uh, the, transition fuel, uh, the transition from the traditional fossil fuels like coal and oil uh, to the more cleaner fossil fuel, which is natural gas. And uh, a lot of movements are going on in that direction. Uh, and for example, in Europe now, natural gas is reclassified as the source of green energy. If uh, you are burning natural gas in the power stations, it's already not so bad. It's already almost good. Uh, and uh, this movement also going in other countries of the world. And uh, recently in September, some discussions uh, were in the, uh, on the fields of United Nations uh, General Assembly in New York also sorry, about reclassifying. The, the, sorry. The last, two se the last sentence, sorry. No, I, I'm telling that uh, recently in September, uh, discussions about reclassification of the natural gas and the source of green energy uh, were being held during the uh, UN General Assembly in New York. And uh, this region, Greater Caspian region, especially eastern part of it, is the, I think, uh, probably one of the biggest in the world uh, source of the natural gas. And for example, only my uh, own country, Turkmenistan, has fourth biggest in the world natural gas reserves. And uh, how to unlock this potential and how to bring this uh, source of energy, which is relatively clean, for example, at least three times cleaner than the coal, 
and uh, a lot of countries uh, in Asia are still burning coal to produce electricity. And uh, uh, it's very difficult to understand, okay, uh, to produce electricity you need the coal, and then uh, we are telling, okay, let's use electric cars and so on, because, uh, but the origin is still not good. And I think uh, bringing natural gas to Asia, this is the big goal which all of us we should try to work on the government level, international level, on the business level, on the PPP uh, schemes. And, uh, for example, eastern part uh, of the Greater Caspian region, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Today, Turkmenistan is, the, uh, by volume, the biggest uh, supplier of natural gas to China. And for China, Turkmenistan is the main source of natural gas. Uh, and also, several projects uh, are being developed. For example, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, gas pipeline called TAPI. Uh, it's already almost three decades under development. Uh, but because of the difficult situation in Afghanistan as a transit country, it's ex uh, it is extremely uh, difficult to move on. But looks like positive movements are going on now in that direction and hope uh, that in three, four years uh, they will officially announce that uh, construction of, of the whole TAPI pipeline will be launched. And uh, uh, this will bring uh, source, uh, the natural gas as a source of cleaner energy to India and Pakistan, and 1.4 billion people and almost uh, 230 million people, 1.6 billion people uh, will be supplied. Uh, also, uh, during the Soviet time, uh, main export routes from the region were going through Russia and mainly going to the west, uh, to Europe. And uh, because of the uh, recent uh, geopolitical situation, uh, countries of the region started to develop alternative routes. And for example, for Kazakhstan crude oil, uh, Kazakhstan now also thinking to go uh, to move this crude oil to, to, to Asia. Uh, and uh, here we can continue. Uh, and also, uh, there is a, as, as I told, 600 million people uh, living in the region. Uh, and uh, a lot of things could be done here. And uh, for example, even for J Japanese economy, for J uh, Japanese companies are very active in the region. And construction companies, engineering, engineering companies, they are building gas processing facilities in Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. I think there's a great potential also for the mutual beneficial cooperation, not only to supply uh, for fossil fuel or natural resources uh, to Asia. Uh, now you asked about the digitalization uh, and inclusive growth, uh, and here also we can see a lot of opportunities. And uh, just uh, one example, because we are in the commodity trading and logistics business, besides uh, our great Caspian Association activity, which I will be a little bit explain later. Uh, for example, commodity trading. Uh, now, because of the commodity prices uh, increased a lot during, after the COVID pandemic and the, because of the uh, following crises, uh, we saw that uh, now one ton of each commodity is at least $1,000. Uh, and uh, it is very difficult, almost impossible, for the small and medium enterprises to be the commodity trading companies. And uh, slowly, slowly, uh, this class of commodity traders disappearing. And uh, now main business being done by the global uh, trading houses uh, and the really large companies with the billions of dollars of equity. And now, uh, but we know that the small and medium enterprises all in each country practically is a backbone of the economy. And how to re-involve uh, these uh, enterprise, uh, small and medium companies to the commodity trading back? And here, I think the solution is uh, uh, involving digital technologies uh, to the business. And for example, very simple solution is marketplaces. Uh, is what? Sorry? Simple marketplaces. So marketplaces. Marketplaces, yeah. Uh, which uh, we can involve blockchain technologies, uh, also track and trace technologies. Uh, and uh, I will just give one example in our life. Uh, for example, what we, what we are trying to develop it's a B2B uh, marketplace for commodities from the Greater Caspian region. Uh, because if you are the producer of commodities in the region, there is no chance you can supply your commodities, no matter what it is. It could be, uh, it would be oil, crude oil, petroleum products, petrochemicals, could be fertilizers, uh, polymers, and any other commo agri commodities, metals, and minerals. Uh, how you can supply to your end user somewhere in Asia, Vietnam, Japan, even China, or India. 
for that, you need to accumulate at least 100,000 ton cargo and move it from the one deep sea port to another deep sea port on the other side of the world. But uh, to accumulate 100,000 ton of cargo, you need $100 million financing. And banks now are very reluctant to finance small and medium enterprises for commodity trading which I think is completely wrong, uh, and they think there is a high risk, and uh, also uh, Greater Caspian region is a, let's say, gray zone for risk because of the war going on just a couple of thousand kilometers from our region. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why business started to be concentrated, and we should forget about inclusive growth, we should forget about uh, competition, uh, like 10, 20 companies in this world, they are doing like majority of commodity trading and uh, not giving any chance for the small and medium enterprises to do the same. And uh, fair, here I think the solution first is market, uh, digital technologies, for example, marketplaces, and also is uh, what we are also developing is trying to connect, trying to split the cargo size from 100,000 ton to as minimum as possible level quantity, on quantity. And here the solution is container transportation because with containers you, should ha you can have only 25 tons cargo size and everybody uh, can open its own company, his own or her own company after graduation from university, put $50,000 capital or $100,000 and start tra commodity trading. Uh, $100,000 is already for containers. You can start trading, you can start earning money, and by that we are liberalizing commodity trading again and re-involving small and medium enterprises again to the commodity trading business and logistics using digital technologies. It's just a simple example. Mm. Uh, mm. Thank on that I will stop, otherwise I could go another one. <laughs> 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 Ten toes, back to you. Can you give us further examples and highlight the, the situations uh, that Murat really uh, ably so well described. Uh, we'll do my best. Um, so from my perspective, if I have to define what digitalization is and how that can provide inclusive growth, also tackle long-term issues like climate change, right? And these technologies are already there. So a farmer somewhere in Southeast Asia can now, even if that farmer hasn't gone to school, they are able to get online through an app, understand climate-friendly, sustainable farming, and how to turn that into a profitable business, and how to actually help absorb the carbon. That to me is the impact of digitalization. A small to medium sized business entrepreneur leveraging digitalization to reach to consumers that they would not have been otherwise been able to reach is digitalization. Breakthrough technologies like blockchain, applying them for climate action is digitalization. Enabling entrepreneurs to create products that will help drive education. We've seen this through COVID. While, yes, nothing replaces in-person schools, but we've also learned how to use technology to spread learning into far and remote places. That to me is digitalization. And all of this to work Strong policy making and strong mm -hmm. institutional support is a must. Let me, let me take a deep breath, together with the audience. We are talking about a very, very large continent. We hear from my right that there exists energy supply, a lot of opportunities. Can, we, can, we can help this region to deal with the current stress, including energy price and maybe agricultural price. And we also know that there exists a lot of uh, possibilities, if we have the data, if we digitize, we can help everyone to be better connected, to better predict, and to better optimize, and to really elevate all the, the potentials and actualize them and bring higher living standards, which we all want here. And maybe when this region grows better, the world will be less stressed. So I think about it, there are two things. In my, there are two big question marks. Number one, to take what Murit talked about earlier, we need a lot of infrastructure development. 
And to do the digitization, we really need to have some way to get all the data and all this together. We allow data not reside in individuals, in business, and in government. But right now, this is an extremely stressed issue. Who has the property rights and so on and so forth? So I'm throwing questions over to my left now. Number one, Alexandro. Please help us to understand how business and government can work together to tap the potential that has been raised here. And after that, Roger, I'm going to turn to you. I want to hear, you, you, I know that you, you know family business inside out or business family, and I want you to tell us about how this new generation, well-educated in the West, and they understand what we are talking about maybe even better, can use their resources and connections to actualize the things that we are all talking about to make our life better. All right, Alexandro. So thank you very much. Uh, two quick reactions before I answer that specifically. One is, I think in the digitalization, um, um, I would be remiss if I didn't advertise my own institution, the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong, because we have recently issued a paper on digitalization in Southeast Asia uh, by uh, experts from Hong Kong, Thailand, and um, oh, he'll forgive me if I forget, but uh, the UK. And, um, uh, and, and the idea is that um, digitalization has indeed accelerated during the pandemic be, uh, out of necessity, but the paper emphasizes really the need for reform and structural change in many of sectors, particularly education, business, healthcare, communications, and banking, and that the institutional frameworks are lacking. In particular, data governance and data security issues, I think, right. are important. One thing to remember is that in digitalization, the low-wage workers are the most at risk from being from automation and um, and and uh, digitalization. So that's an important question that we have to really realize. In, in terms of climate so change, so the technology in may possibly it, create right. a progressive and, growth. And indeed, you know, I mean, a regressive growth. When, when you talk about all these sort of climate change finance um, products and everything, you know, is that finance? Are the projects going to go to help? the people most affected by climate change. The climate injustice issue is, is often overlooked because you might actually be going, you know, projects where, you know, I mean, goes, goes to uh, EVs or what have you, but is it really going to people most affected by climate? Now, um, the other thing I would just mention is that we often focus too much on Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific at the peril of thinking about Eurasia, this emerging concept, what Kent Calder uh, calls the supercontinent. And I think this is a very important aspect because it's not just about the United States and the Pacific and uh, United States, China. It's also about what China, Russia, and indeed uh, that place that we don't really know about, at least those of us sitting maybe in Hong Kong, uh, Central Asia. And what's happening there, and a lot is happening. In terms of infrastructure, uh, I think this is uh, crucial. Now, um, I'm just going to very quickly focus on the Philippines in this question. So, um, because I was anticipating your question, because you very um, advised me about it, I went and looked at the infrastructure projects um, out of the Philippines under the, the Duterte administration. Now, I'm not a fan of the Duterte administration, let me tell you. Um, but um, at least uh, in the latter years, he did focus on infrastructure and on uh, making it easier for uh, foreign direct investment in many different areas, including infrastructure. And in, um, he had about 119 projects. So infrastructure is, everybody is now thinking that this is the great equalizer. In a country like the Philippines, where you have persistent inequality since the 1950s, pretty much at the same level, um, where is the financing coming from? You'll be surprised. You might think, oh, China's uh, uh, BRI um, uh, financing most of the infrastructure. But in fact, it is Japan that in Southeast Asia is the biggest uh, financer of infrastructure. In the Philippines, it's particularly true. And that has a lot to do with this idea that, as we heard yesterday, that Japan has focused on, you know, a bit of a knock on the BRI, but on quality infrastructure, quality. The idea that, you know, this infrastructure won't get washed away uh, when the monsoons come. So I, I looked at it. You know, if you looked at headline infrastructure projects in the Duterte administration, most of it was financed by the Philippine budget itself then by PPPs, then by Japan ODA, about the same PPPs and J Japanese ODA, uh, then uh, coming in at the rear, ADB ODA and 
China grants. So <laughs> let me just tell you that, that I think this is the way of the world, PPPs in particular. Yep. I'm concerned in terms of PPPs, which just take longer to come on stream, longer to organize, that if you have countries affected heavily by debt, this makes it more difficult to do uh, um, you know, right. but, but it's essential because right. if, if governments are saddled with debt, they must go down the PPP yeah. route. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I work with the ADB ones, and the projection is that in the next 10 years, the infrastructure development in the region is about 1.6 trillion US. With the interest rate and so on and so forth, you have to activate the private wealth, otherwise you can't do right. it. And then the electronic, the digitization, actually is an opportunity for us to do something together because you can develop smart contracts, you can, ease, you can more readily monitor the development and make projects, uh, workable projects. Um, so I, I, I have... You know, if I could just add quickly, you know, yeah. I think one of the issues here is that there are all manner of funds now coming in. I mean, KKR just uh, exactly. launched a second right. Asia infrastructure fund. The Chinese have a new fund. There's funds available from the Quad and etc. Yeah. The key is, can you combine business acumen with... Right. Uh, right. right. And also, I'm thinking about combining, like, Singapore, Japan. Singapore is very advanced in the digitization, and Japan and uh, China has the infrastructure development capability. If you can put a whole region's capability together, tomorrow will be really very rosy. Yeah. One last uh, intervention. Uh, you know, Canada has a memorandum of understanding with China since 2016, I believe, for doing infrastructure finance right. with China, joint development with, in third countries. We haven't used it yet. Why? Because of all the uh, problems uh, related to geopolitics, and you'll recall the Meng Wanzhou right. to Michael's case. So in fact, there's an opportunity there, but Canada does not have a policy, official policy on the BRI. We are members, Canada is a member of the AIIB, yeah. the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, but refuses to actually have any position on the BRI. So if you're going to do this kind of uh, third country cooperation to build infrastructure, but you're resisting the BRI, how, how can anything right. move forward, right? I mean, in terms of the it, geopolitics. What uh, you just got right. onto is something about how we can resolve the tension, right. then we'll get a lot better, and I really like the idea about PPP. We, we'll talk about that further later, but let me turn to Roger, because I really want to see if there are unsung heroes, family, private business, whatever, that really can do something positive for the whole region. Um, sorry, the world, very often when you open up the front page, is miserable. So I'm trying to make us all optimistic and hopeful. And right now we have seen possibilities about energy, about digitization, about developing of infrastructure, the PPP, and let's ring in the private sector. Roger, you have to tell me who are the unsung heroes. Give me examples, give me anecdotes, what they did. Well, there are If you don't, yeah. I won't buy you a drink. <laughs> he did buy me a drink before. <laughs> now I buy you dinner. It's your turn. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you, you know, the, actually, to me, the unsung, uh, unsung heroes are really the small, medium-sized enterprises itself in, in, in this part of the world. And they're not necessarily getting recognition. But these are the people who can work together. They have common goals. And they are not very politically oriented. That's Bingo. the key. Right? You know, we, we have to address these issues itself. I mean, one of our biggest problems in this part of the world also is what I call the wealth gap, okay? And we somehow have to close that wealth gap. And also, I mean, uh, recently we're doing a, a comparative study of uh, uh, Indian diaspora, Chinese diaspora, and uh, Jewish diaspora in terms of from a family business. And one of the key points that comes across that are very, very common amongst the uh, three groups, the importance of education. You know, without proper education, you just can't move forward, okay? So, you, you, you know, a lot of uh, people are just sitting around uh, just waiting for handouts. That is not gonna work. And the younger generation are getting better educated and they understand each other a lot more, whether it's through digitization or otherwise. They can communicate. 
And we really got to, you know, the only way we can move forward is not to isolate, oh, uh, let, let's create an organization uh, that excludes certain groups, right? I mean, you, you look at some of the uh, uh, organizations that are set up, a uh, PPT or whatever it is, where's China in that group, right? Right. So, you, you know, you've got to have in everyone involved. And the younger people are not bound by these uh, restrictions and so forth. And I think there's hope, but we've got to give them more opportunities to speak up and uh, opportunities to participate. This is very, very. So I would say they're also the unsung heroes, and, and we really need to go through that. And education and, uh, you know, these so-called small, uh, medium-sized enterprises, they can work together, you know. And it's very, very, that, that's what I think uh, we need. We need more communication, we need more cooperation, and that's the only way we're going to move forward. Otherwise, we're just going to, you know, have all these uh, problems that, that we're facing right now. I mean, of course, we've got the Ukraine issue, and, uh, you, you know, who, who, who's fanning the uh, problems in Taiwan itself? It's not the mainland China. China is not going there to create problems, right? I, I won't say who. Uh, by the way, I'm an American-born Chinese, so, you know. Uh, you, you, you know, so the world can only survive, you know, if we can work together on a cooperative basis. I, I uh, thank you very much. I really like your point about cooperative spirit. And we'll get onto that later. I'm going to turn to all my panelists and ask them to, to help us uh, to think about how we can contribute to more connectivity better communications, so that we have a better chance to gain a better tomorrow. But I talk, you, since I asked you for anecdotes, and so let me offer one myself. I have a student. He went to Africa when he was having the, the Ebola scares. And he was broken, but he was, he was in ship. It was in shipping before, and he had scrapped the, the bottom of the ships, and so he tried everything. He went to Africa and he find mining. And he started to do mining. And then because of his upbringing, he know the pain of the poor people. So he actually worked with the villagers and built schools and built railroads and built highways and built all this with the support of his rich people. And after he built all this, he is able to now export a lot of the, the minerals from an African country to Asia. So this is an example about the rich family grew up in a very poor, deprived uh, place of origin, understand how to work with people. And he, he, he worked on the Bell Road Initiative before the Bell Road Initiative came out. So these are examples about family business with the means and the connections that can connect the poor and the rich together to develop something. Um, so now, one, we, Asia has a lot of hope for growth, and our growth is still, if I look at it, at the, um, the US, Europe, China, uh, China is part of Asia, but th this, this part of the region is, is doing, and Japan, you know, is doing reasonably okay. But we cannot take things for granted. We need to tap the energy. We need to build infrastructure. We need, to, uh, we need to deal with the climate change. We need to do more digitization and empower more people with this kind of thing. Okay? But all these are long-term projects. Anyone who invests will know that if the tomorrow is uncertain, you are scared. You don't go into long-term investment. So far, so good. And what is scary for us right now is the lack of communication between two major camps, China and US. So I want all of you to come up with an idea how we can contribute to make the communication better. And to hopefully that will we'll help to we'll participate to soften the tension. I'm going to offer one example myself. Okay? I'm also an American passport holder. Thanksgiving is coming. I would wish that the U.S. and China could count the blessings of their past cooperation. China's productive labor force and savings have given the U.S. a long period of low inflation and growth. 
and also because of the wide market for application, it, it stimulates a lot of uh, high-tech uh, high growth, and also the, the Chinese and the Indian students, and they contribute a lot in the research. At the same time, China, um, China really benefit from the U.S. education and science and have helped try China tremendously in the growth in the past 40 years. So I think that both sides should really write a thank you card, a Thanksgiving thank you card to each other and say, I thank you for your contribution. I see the beauty of our cooperation in the past. Okay, I, I, that is the way I feel about it, being a Chinese and then also an American. And I really hope that we can contribute to really soften the, 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 the tension among the situation. So I'm going to go from my far right to my far left. Please give us something, you know, um, that, um, that, will, uh, that, will con uh, that will be conducive to a meaningful communication between China and U.S. to allow each other to appreciate each other more and, um, and we'll, we'll turn around to do cooperation instead of confrontation. Yes, not an easy question. Uh, the whole world is thinking about this. Uh, but uh, I believe that uh, the best way uh, to improve relations between the parties is uh, to do kind of a joint projects. And uh, for, back to our greater Caspian region, uh, China losing interest for the Belt and Road Initiative, what we saw uh, in the last uh, Chinese five years plan announced. They want to concentrate more on domestic circulation. They don't want anymore to be the fabric of the world. And they don't uh, want so aggressively and intensively uh, develop the infrastructure outside China. Uh, and uh, on the other side, uh, U.S., uh, they're gaining interest in the region because of the Russian-Ukraine war, and they see this region also the source of a lot of energy uh, and resources, minerals, and so on. Uh, why don't uh, to create, no, not to create, uh, kind of the joint project coordination task uh, between the U.S. and China to develop projects uh, in the third countries, for example, in the Greater Caspian region? And I will just, just give you one uh, example, uh, another 30 seconds, that uh, in 2019, just before COVID, and when the Belt and Road Initiative was full, fully in force, uh, China signed with Switzerland memorandum for strategic memorandum understanding for strategic cooperation for develop and development of projects in the Belt and Road markets. And for example, in the mm -hmm. Central Asian Greater Caspian region, why not to do the same between China and US? I love the idea. Some countries in the larger part of Asia can work together to bring two camps together to cooperate to do something meaningful. Thank you. Um, Santos, um, I would like to you're now living in Atlanta. You're very close to Washington. You can help us. <laughs> I, I am. I am. I mean, we're not just you know, hearing about the, the tension between U.S. and China. We're experiencing it and we're feeling it. Um, it's real. As uh, Bernard said, both China and U.S. have in the past enjoyed each other's strengths and benefits. This is not the era of divide. This is not the era of tension or techno-nationalism. I think this is the era of innovation, collaboration, leveraging technology. They say that when you have, com when you have common stern uh, threats, even stern enemies become friends. The threats we have are real and they are common and they apply to China just as much as they apply to US. Whether it is opportunities, climate change, external threats, cybersecurity threats, they're all common threats. And this is the time for us to become friends. Yes, we have to provide opportunities to our respective citizens, build resilience, but dividing and drawing lines is not the way. I think, as uh, uh, Murat said, it's about collaboration, joint projects. I'll give you one example. Uh, when I was pursuing my PhD, uh, I had, a, I had a, my, my, my colleagues where one, you know, one person was from China, one person was from UK, one person was from India, and one person was from US. And we were all very determined to do analysis on genes and alleles to find out alleles and the impact of a particular allele on 
propensity or let, let's say propensity of alcoholism. So it was a common effort with a common goal to find a common cure to a common problem. That's the way to go, in my opinion. Wonderful. Come, repeat your comments again, common. We had a, we had a common group coming together to find common a common goal. solution to yep. a common threat right. that applied to all of us. Wonderful. Four comments. Thank you. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask uh, my... Uh, um, I understand time is over, but I talked to Frank, and we start late, and to, uh, Frank told us that we have a few elbow room minutes, so we'll, we'll finish that very soon. Uh, Roger and then Alexandra. Okay. Well, I'll make my comment very, very brief. You mentioned Thanksgiving. Actually, Chinese and Americans should have Thanksgiving dinner more often. Why? Chinese prefer dark meat, and <laughs> Americans prefer white meat. So, you know, you, the same turkey you can share uh, uh, very, very nicely. And this brings up a key point. We really need to understand each other's culture. We're different. U.S., a Western culture, and Eastern culture are very, very different. Yet, you know, people don't understand each other that well. Unless we understand Chinese prefer dark meat and Westerners prefer white meat, we're just not going to move forward. So I just make that comment. And we understand what each other wants and we collaborate. Yes. Sorry, Turkey, you're gone. <laughs> Alexandra. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, I wrote a piece that was published on Thursday uh, on my reaction to the Xi-Biden meeting in Bali. And it's all there, my wish. <laughs> um, basically, I, I think that you know, if you look behind the headlines and certainly you know, the, the, uh, behind even the Xi Biden meeting, we're at a point where, despite what the media might lead you to believe, we have the most interaction between senior officials of the United States and China going on right now, from Jake Sullivan, Blinken, Yellen, Raimondi, all the way down, Catherine Tsai. They're communicating now quite regularly with their counterparts and with the new counterparts that are going to come in. And now you have the senior level, uh, and then Blinken is already uh, committed to going to China early in the year. So if you go back, we're closest to the so-called strategic economic dialogue that the S and E D that was in place during the Obama administration and started in the George W. Bush administration. My wish would be that we can move forward and reinstitutionalize re that kind of regular uh, far-reaching, broad-ranging discussion between the U.S. and China across, and not just the senior level, but all the way down. And the SE and ED was very much down to uh, lower level uh, officials. Uh, I'm not saying G2, although, you know, if you have that kind of framework, it then, and you combine it with agency, that is, recognize, the US and China recognize the agency of the middle, countries in the middle, particularly ASEAN, that we have authentic ASEAN centrality, yes. but also that countries in the middle, including ASEAN, recognize their agency and fully exercise it. I think ASEAN's problem is often that it hasn't fully exercised its own agency. So it takes two to tango or more than two to tango, so you need countries in the middle have to understand that they have that agency. Lastly, I would just focus on trade. Uh, we haven't talked right. about RCEP or CPTPP. If you think about uh, the CPTPP, which, to which the Chinese have applied, and Taiwan has applied, and the UK Act has applied. Well, why not uh, bring them into the CPTPP? Uh, RCEP, RCEP is the biggest right. trade bloc in the, in the world. Why not uh, right. expand it? Right. Um, I would just say, if you look at the membership of RCEP, you look at the membership of CPTPP, you look at the membership of the United States uh, offer, which is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, countries that are in all of those, Brunei, small economy, yeah. uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam. Right. If you want to think about where opportunities might lie in this region, yeah. those might be we, your bets. Yeah. We, we have to wrap up. Let me try to strain the conversation together. This is a region that has a lot. Asia, many part of Asia is a region that has a lot of hope for growth. But all, uh, I mean, um, the, con the, the estimation is about 5% and beyond. But this growth is not preordained, may not happen. 
and it needs a lot of long-term infrastructure development, whether it's energy or infrastructure um, or uh, digitization or putting the handphones onto more and more people and use that possibility. But the international tension is Co is providing maybe some diversification capital, but it's also a lot of stress that forbid us from developing for long developing long term projects. It's a concern, and we all really in this region of the world. We really uh, I'm talking about ASEAN, South Asia, and many parts. We really want to grow, and we do. As I listen, we do have a common group, as you said, and we have a common problem. And the common problem is, one of it is about getting people together to find a common solution, which is better communication, and let people work together, and where there is ease and where's, and so on and so forth. So I, I feel that it's very hopeful. We have the desire, we have the common group, and we know what the common solution would be. All that we need to do is just to work together. Whether we are talking about Japan, we love, the, we love them, um, or Europe, or, or North America, or China. This is a part of the world that maybe we can create a way out of the current tension mark the situation. And if that's the case, I think Asian will be proud. And I think countries like Singapore, India, and so on and so forth, they have an opportunity, and Asians together, they have an opportunity to actualize this rosy dream. dream. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the audience. Put your hands together to thank them for the, for the meaningful participation. Thank you.